So what am I going to talk about today? <laughs> um, lots of people to thank. We have big teams. I just put the big machine team. There's so many people. I have a bunch of people working on Evoke here, a bunch of physicists, oncologists that help, some collaborators who are were working on interesting projects, which I'll talk about. And there's a whole bunch of uh, nice research uh, and slash clinical initiatives that we're, we're also looking at using some of the tech I'm going to talk about today. Uh, some of this work is funded by NSERC and CHR as well. So, uh, you might have seen this slide before. This is uh, from David's uh, Nature paper, which sort of describes, I think, the big machine in a nice cartoony way. Uh, and in that, it articulates exactly all the things that we are able to measure or can measure or want to measure. Um, and it really nicely shows that we have lots of patients that come through the door, but the number of patients that we actually can use that could be applied to the big machine is actually very small. So I think this is one of the challenges. And there's a number of ways we can try to achieve that. And I think part of this talk is, is trying to describe how that might happen. So um, you, you might see this slide like four times, but this is the big machine, uh, which you've probably seen before. But the big machine, uh, really quick, is taking data from many data sources. So some of the data sources we have a lot of control over, so some imaging data sources, some intervention data sources. Uh, we have some outcome data sources, but not many of them. Um, we can get lots of people to do this, really smart people to get this data for us. Um, and, and there's lots of other parts to the big machine that would go this way that we're really good at as well. So we're good at quality assurance. We can do feature extractions. You know, Chris, Chris will talk about this. Machine learning, again, we don't have a lot of expertise, but we can, we can do. Again, this will go to Chris soon. Um, and we can ultimately make this uh, connection to um, doing some type of prediction, whatever, whatever we want. Uh, and so the big machine um, is, wanting to, is a, a way to use big data and is building this infrastructure to take all the data from all these data sources. But also there's this uh, component to it that's very interesting and that is we don't want the data that we have but we want the data from other hospitals who are building other models to either give us more data, right, so we can fill in the gaps or maybe there's some type of data we don't have or some intervention or some imag imaging modality that we don't employ that's actually important that someone else does and we can then use that data in a nice cohesive way. And I'll talk a little bit about a, a project that Patricia, Lindsay and I are, are collaborating with some people with Mastro about um, soon. So what's the big machine going to do? So it ultimately will take a patient that comes to the door and give them the most personalized care possible for the imaging and the uh, analysis and the, ther uh, the tr treatment intervention that we have right now. So basically this is like the holy grail of cancer care as we know it. So uh, last week was Star Wars Day, May the 4th. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about Star Wars uh, in, in some way. What, a, what an opportunity. I've never given a talk in May before. So... Um, <laughs> So then I was thinking, okay, so Star Wars, big machine. Um, so if the big machine was Star Wars, um, what's, what's, what, what's the similarity? So, um, so what, I, what I went to, so I went to IMDb and I went to Rotten Tomatoes. So IMDb is a database that ranks movies and Rotten Tomatoes is uh, you know, uh, a user score, critic scoring of movies. And so what, what happened when the first set of movies came out in 1977? There was a universal love for these Star Wars movies. So I thought, who wouldn't like the big, who wouldn't love the big machine, really, right? It's going to answer all of our problems. It's going to use all the great data that we collect. It's going to harness all of this um, imaging expertise and therapeutic expertise. So this is what I think the big machine is. So unfortunately, in this talk, we're not really talking about the big machine. So this is the medium machine. So this is like maybe a little earlier than what the big machine will be. And then um, in 1999, there was a set of, started a set of trilogies which um, in, story, in story chronology actually preceded the original set of movies. So these were considered prequels. And these were sort of universally panned uh, both by critics and by fans. So um, 
maybe we should skip the prequel, but <laughs> uh, hopefully um, after you know half an hour or so, maybe I'll convince you that it might be worth chipping away at, at the big machine uh, without it being, being fully formed. So what I'm gonna do, uh, or what Chris and I are gonna do, sorry, is basically describe these two data streams here and how uh, we, slice across, we, we slice across these. And we have really been focused mostly just because of the data we have access to on sort of technical predictions uh, rather than say outcomes or something like toxicity which we would all ultimately get to with the big machine. So uh, there's a lot of examples of where we're using data in a very smart way to infer some type of outcome. So here we're taking a look at technology before and after 2004 and we can see that overall survival has improved as we've increased technology in RT. I'll just go through these pretty quick. Uh, similarly again we're taking a look at um, when the rectum is, re rectum is distended, in, in this cohort of patients, by, uh, local control changes uh, based, based on this fact. And so this is very interesting. And this is like a very small facet, I guess, if you would consider the big machine. And the fact that something like this was pulled out with very little data is, is again, interesting. Uh, another great paper, which is often cited, is this paper, which is basically showing that uh, treatment plans that conform to established protocols result in better survival than those that fail. So this is great from our perspective because basically this is attaching quality to outcome. And so that's very interesting. That's, that's a compelling argument to both improve quality and standardization and all that good stuff that we do. Uh, finally, this, this paper came out, this is from Ertz in Nature, and what this paper was showing was that they can use radiomics, so they actually distilled this down to basically four radiomic features, which are imaging features, and then they could correlate this to different, or they could separate uh, this out uh, in survival uh, based on radiomic features and how this is related to, uh, to gene expression. So, so again, too, this is very interesting. They use a little bit more data. There was some machine learning involved. There was feature extraction. And so this is go going a little bit further than, say, the other two studies. But this is sort of what we're, what we're going to be looking at now. So um, Chris will go into much more detail and, and um, interesting discussion about this. But basically, this is the challenge that we're dealing with all the time. We are trying to do some type of classification, right? So if we're doing a prediction uh, for outcome, or we could be doing something like as provocative as saying this is a good plan or not, so we're classifying the plan as good or not, or I'm trying to classify a voxel in an image to what I think the most appropriate dose is in that image. Um, in terms of quality, we can use the same sort of structure to separate out, say, regions of interest in a plan, and I showed this at the the genomic symposium uh, last month, but basically we can take any delineated structure and actually say, I, you don't need to tell me what it is, I'll tell you based on its uh, features. And so, so that's great because you have a plan, maybe different, even for the same site, uh, or maybe spanning different sites, and then you might see something like this, which would be an absolute nightmare if you were wanting to do any type of data mining, or you wanted to and to do any type of analysis, because you would need to know all of these different variations on this name for the structure. Uh, in addition to the fact, this patient is, this is a right lung and not a left lung. So how would that impact downstream any data that we analyze for this patient? So um, as I said, we can do this uh, just using the same sort of cartoon to describe, and, and a lot of the focus of the talk is going to be about automated planning, and what we're basically doing there is relating features related in the image or in regions of interest to dose features, so that we can say, based on these imaging features, I can then predict what the dose is going to be. So, uh, so uh, when, when I proposed this to, to some people down the hall from me, they said, this will never work, Tim Craig. <laughs> Um, and, and so it's, uh, it, it's, it's a little, <laughs> I, I cleared it with Tim, he knew it was, he knew it was in there. Um, so, so Tim said, this is, forget about this, is, this is never going to happen. So, um, and, and fair enough. So, you know, we're, we're working on the problem. The interesting thing about the automated, uh, automated process we're talking about is we actually flip around how we 
do planning. And so if we think about planning in this way, uh, between taking an image, doing contouring, placing beams, doing an optimization, reviewing, and then finally publishing that plan, we could, we could change this quite, quite easily. So in this framework, we would take an image, we would contour only the, inter, only the ROIs we're interested in, right? So targets and any OAR that we would want to evaluate. Anything else we could essentially throw away because it's not needed. So that's, that's quite nice. If you take a look at some ROI list for some plan classes, they're, they're absolutely gigantic and you have limiting structures and avoid structures and uh, modified structures and optimization structures and all of that can go away. And what we can do, and Chris will go into the details of this, but we can actually say voxel by voxel, I know what I want the dose distribution to be. And this is not based on, say, DVHs, right? This is based on the spatial distribution. And then from this, we can use some existing tech that exists in a race station, academia, to go and turn that distribution into something that's deliverable, that now has beams and apertures and weighting that we can actually treat the patient with. So this stage here is actually just a map of dose. It's almost like someone painted this on this picture. And there's no beams associated with it, no deliverability with this, but we can actually do, turn this into something useful. Tim, Chris will talk about this more. Okay, so uh, you might have heard uh, about Evoke. I've done a couple demos for planners and some site groups and some physicists. And so, so what's Evoke? So I, I, I try to come up with like a, a new tagline every time I do this. Um, so this one is ROIs name things like PTV new or GTV do not use are not allowed here anymore. So we're gonna get away from naming like ridiculous things in these plans and to a nice consistent way that we can actually use later for planning. So what is Evoke? So Evoke's uh, a web-based tool for visualization. It's a plan approval process, which is interesting. So it could sort of replace some of the functionality of web publishing. But there's also an opportunity here through this, this review approval stage to actually have uh, clinical experts, like everyone in this room, to curate data in a very, very nice way in it, and then put it into a place, a repository that we can then parse and access later. So it's actually really interesting. Another part about Evoke is automated QA. So we're not going to get some bad plans in the system and maybe we'll catch that right lung that's really a left lung or vice versa. So Evoke exists, like it is something tangible. I'm not going to show, go into any detail, but Basically, you can look at a plan in it, um, and there's a lot of nice automated workflow to view stuff and also to score plans. So um, some of what I've already mentioned is, exists in this pipeline. So this, this Evoke pipeline is able to do all kinds of interesting stuff in terms of ripping data, patient features, radiomics, spatial distribution, able to look at plan quality. We can find errors in plans. We can provide confident in intervals, uh, estimates for plans, in addition to, as I said, have a nice warehouse of data. So every, data, every plan that comes in now can effectively be scored and cataloged in a nice way that we can go back and pull out. And we can then use this into something like the big machine. So this has taken a, one step further, if you will, in terms of what we're going to do in terms of ripping data and doing extraction. And so we have a, a student from Mastro who's uh, Andre Decker's uh, student who's coming to work with Patricia and I on this CanCap project, which is analogous to the EuroCap project you may have heard about, which is a distributed learning platform where you locally have data, and what you want to do is build a model based on your data. And so what the benefit of doing this is that you can share data with other centers, if you will, via a model without actually explicitly giving them any data. So that's nice from a regulatory point of view, a patient privacy point of view. And so we can build our own model, we can ship it to someone else, someone else can ship us their model, and then we can test our data in a nice way. And so this is a project we're gonna be working over the summer. Um, it's focused on lung right now. And they've already done this, uh, this me method, but we're going we're gonna to try it here. And then once we have this infrastructure in place, then we can expand this out. But again, too, this is a small component of the big machine as well. So, 
so we, we talk about the big machine, uh, and so it, it, I don't want the, I don't want to think of the big machine as being a final. So so the good news is um, last year um, there was a new Star Wars movie. If, if you like Star Wars, and actually this one did pretty good. So so um, this this one scored a little high. So I think if we want to think of the the Star Wars analogy, maybe there's some more promise beyond the big machine, and I think we might need to start thinking about what that might be now, rather than wait for the big machine to be built, but. Because I think what we need to change is think about new ways, new things to test, what, what new interventions we might have, and what impact that might, might have overall in the, in the process. So I'm going to stop, and now Chris is going to talk about some much more interesting uh, work. Uh, uh, but I'll just, I'll just start with some machine learning at the beginning, because this is a lot of what Chris was a computer scientist, and this is a lot of, or the, the essence of what we're going to be, a, a lot of the, what the work is about. So, machine learning. The study and construction of algorithms that can learn and make predictions on data. So this is at the second level in the big machine. This is also known as pattern recognition. And what you basically do is you throw a computer thousands of examples and ask them to predict, or make a prediction based on a novel data that's unseen. So this sounds great um, and is very complicated, uh, but it's something that we've been working on for three years on a number of different fronts, um, and I'll have Chris talk to you about it. Thanks. Oh, there we go. Okay, so as Tom was mentioning, so machine learning is a lot of uh, my background, computer science. Um, and the interesting thing that they've done over the years is really develop methods to try to emulate a lot of tasks that humans can do. That's sort of what we're interested in, trying to figure out how human beings do things and, and then learn how to do them. Um, so one of the most classic examples is actually in digit recognition. So what they did is they gave computers thousands and thousands, actually about 10,000 examples of each digit, and then they trained the computer then to be able to recognize the digit. And one might think of this as a trivial task that any computer should be able to do. And in fact, when they first thought about doing this in the 1980s, they figured, yeah, I'll probably need a week. Uh, it took about 20 years. Um, and a lot of it is because you can see a lot of these numbers Humans don't write very consistently. Maybe we learned to when we were like six, and then as we got older and older and older, we decided, yeah, you know what? I don't need that extra line on my seven. This saves me a quarter of a second. I don't care if the computer can recognize this or not. And so the problem is actually challenging due to the variability in how we write. So it's interesting, though, that we have been able to solve this. So actually, nowadays, a computer can recognize faces and digits at the accuracy that meets or exceeds a human being's. And that's really happened in the last five to 10 years. And this graph on the left basically shows is the kind of accuracy for digit or for, sorry, for facial recognition over time. And what you can kind of see is where the red line transitions, that's when the governments got really interested in this. The applications are very obvious. It's security, they want to know who you are, and they do. Um, so basically at this point, Facebook is about 97 to 98% accurate. Google claims 99. We figure the government's about 99 and a half. And this is not even straight on. These are at angles with sunglasses. This is state of the art. And a lot of it's been enabled by things we hear about cloud computing. Because now we can take tens of millions of examples of pictures of people from all over the world and train huge supercomputers to do this. 
But there's a lot of question when any, ever anyone does this, especially when it's coming to medicine. We've heard about computer-aided diagnosis for years, and it's not gotten a lot of uptake. And a lot of that, I think, is because people often present this thing, the black box that we've all heard of, and everyone goes, what the heck is that? I don't like it. I'm afraid. And the black box takes the zero on the left, and the computer then goes and does magic things, and it produces you know, a zero as a final output. And so some people may have even seen a slide like this that opens the black box, but probably is even more confusing than the black box itself. What are all these little nodes, and why do they connect? So this is called a convolutional neural network. This is our best mathematical representation of how the brain actually thinks, according to a certain stream of scientists anyway. But from a mathematics perspective, what this really does isn't actually that mystical. You take a whole bunch of digits and you feed them to the computer. And then you ask it for representations of what those digits look like. So what are the most common elements? And the computer then goes and figures out something very natural. So all of those layers in along the bottom left-hand side of that graph actually correspond to these high-level represent or low-level representations of digits on the right-hand side. And if you look at that graph, you can see things like a little line indicating a 1 or a circle indicating a 0. And you can actually break that down. So how the computer recognizes a digit, and if you've heard of these things called deep learning, this is effectively what it does, it then takes those part models along the top, so you can see there's part of a 5, part of a 1, part of a 0, and now when it gets a digit, it's then recognizing, okay, I've got that line for the, or sorry, the line for the 1, maybe that's part of the 2, then it'll go and check now there's the rest of that top of the 2. So as it feeds through that network, it's building a higher and higher level of representation and piecing everything together. That's why it's this sort of representation or emulation of how we do things. We know that at the bottom level of the human visual system is actually a response vector very similar to that. Humans measure little tiny gradients in the image, and then they have higher level thinking to piece it all together to make a larger scale decision. But that's been the biggest challenge in machine learning, is being able to get it to do that high level knowledge. That's what's taken huge amounts of hardware, and that's why it's really started to advance over the last five to 10 years. So what can this do in radiation therapy? I mean, if digits are hard, then how, how are we going to do anything here? Well, in some ways, they're going to be harder and easier, and I'll kind of go through why. So but what we want to be able to do is recognize now a patient, not a digit. So if there's only a thousand or probably a much larger number of that, but different types of patients in the world, and I want to be able to automatically bring them in and say, okay, I've seen you before. This is your, basically your twin. So when I treat you, I'm going to treat you the same way I treated you the last time I saw you, even though it wasn't really you. We then went to derive these sort of relationships between different patients, between different radiotherapy plans, and then we can go between plans and patients to be able to really quantify both. And we can then use these relationships to infer knowledge. So we can take a patient and infer a plan, and I'll show some examples of that. Uh, we've seen where radiomics is trying to take a patient and infer an outcome. We can use plans to infer outcomes, and really where we want to get to with the big machine is using patients, plans, and all sorts of other data as well to be able to infer outcomes and other new knowledge. So a lot of this starts with, just like we did with the digit, encoding the patient as a vector. And so this vector is then used to quantify the patient. This is our big stream of features that we're going to capture in the system. The system is then trained to predict the desired output, whether it's the outcome or predict the patient's age, a degree of disability, whatever it is. And it tries to then learn how experts, like everybody here, visually <laughs> assesses the image and the plan to reach the conclusions that you guys are also good at doing. So this is just a toy example of a two-dimensional problem. Uh, just to show what some of the features can look like in radiotherapy, because once we move up to three-dimensional planning, the features become 3D and they're hard to visualize. Uh, but so in 2D here, we basically, on the left-hand side, we have all those little boxes corresponding to a feature. And if you look at the one inside the red box, and it basically corresponds to a scale of the purple box on the right-hand side, you can notice a really bright edge along the top. So what the computer has, it's never been told to do this, but it's just been told, I want to deliver radiation therapy where we deliver radiation therapy in these patients. And it then figured out, well, knowing where the collarbone is is very important to know where I'm going to put that radiation. So that's its equivalent of breaking down the digit into a part of a 1 or a part of a 2. There's features here that represent where the collarbone is. There's other features you can see 
that are really bright, for example, here in the, in the bottom left, pointing at the top, that's figuring out how far it is from the chin. So these are all very natural things that we'll look at. And if we just draw a black box, of course, it seems like, well, how could this ever work? And that's why we get such skepticism. But when we break it down and look at the features, they're actually quite intuitive and not that complicated. So once we move into 3D uh, patient uh, radiation therapy planning, what does it mean for patients to be similar? And this is another thing we sort of run into. Like, does it just mean that all the voxels in the images match? And all of a sudden, I'm going to literally have to observe every instantiation of a patient to make something like this work. And obviously, that's not, that's not feasible. We can't image that many people. So it's really just that these two patients could actually be very simple, similar from a treatment perspective, even if they look very different. And we want the computer to figure out what the modes of relevant variation are. So for example, that it doesn't matter the shape of the patient's right lung and the right arm. That's not relevant if we're trying to treat the breast in this image. We only want to look at the variability of that breast and of that lung and that heart. The rest of it doesn't matter. And all of a sudden, we need to capture far fewer examples. So this is, builds this patient and plan relationship where we want similar patients to receive similar treatment when they come, when they come in. And we don't want to measure it by just intensity. We want to actually look at things like the ROI shape. So we're going to segment like the target or the other organs, as well as even things we don't segment by looking at those gradient-based features and get a holistic representation of the patient. And we can also do a very similar thing for plans as well. And together, then using that information, we can build concepts of that when a target is near a heart, we treat it differently than when a target is far away. So this is the sort of the medium framework because what we're really doing here is we're building basically two pillars of the big machine and then the pillar that goes, or the big part that goes across the top. So the machine learning and we have two example data, data pillars. And so these are the imaging and intervention pillars and we're going to use that then with the machine learning on the top to answer four questions um, that I'll give some examples of here. Uh, we'll do auto QA, uh, so plan quality assessment and some automated planning and then I'll show what we'd like to do in our future work on um, outcomes. So some of these are some slides that were uh, presented by uh, Dr. Kathy Rock at uh, COMP. Um, and basically, here what we want to do is we want to be able to figure out the complexity of a plan so that when it goes through rounds, at the beginning of rounds, you automatically know these are the plans we have to spend the most amount of time talking about. So we're going to deal with them first so we don't come to the end of rounds and all of a sudden come up with a plan that we need to spend half an hour and everybody's going over time. We'll do the easiest plans last. So it's a kind of a simple problem, but there's a lot of intriguing aspects to it. And the basic hypothesis then is that different plans, features paired with different image features will give us a way to measure the complexity of a treatment and build this sort of space like Tom was showing before where those different complexities will end up in different areas of that space and the computer can then go and re recognize what the complexity of a plan is paired with the patient. So the first part of that is plan feature extraction. So we just have a ray station shot of a plan here at the bottom. But we can extract features like the control point geometry, the fraction weighting, ROI features, so how close the target is to the heart, the shape and the intensity and the appearance of both, and the dose map shape, and these sorts of things. Um, so this is just a giant list of ROI features. A lot of these are basically radiomic features that are in that paper, um, plus a lot more, but really just capturing the shape of an object the intensity in it, its texture, visual appearance, that sort of thing. And then we did a study, so preliminary data with 375 RT patients uh, acquired um, over about a year in rounds. And then AutoQA learned to rank the plans to match for the review discussion priority. We measured the performance where basically 1.0 was a perfect match if it always got the plans in the correct order. Uh, random is about 0.61. Uh, auto QA came in around 0.82, which is actually pretty good. It gets it about 75% of the time it beats the existing method of doing four field before two, before boost. Uh, so just give you an example. So this is a low complexity plan that's automatically scored as being low complexity. And this is a high complexity plan with uh, non coplanar beams. So this same system can also not only detect if a plan is complex or not, but whether or not a plan should be rejected. So then we went through and trained on the rejected plans that we have here at the hospital. Um, so we did it again, preliminary breast study. It detects about 80% of the rejected plans here at Princess Margaret. 
Uh, so this is an example here of a rejected plan where the purple line basically represents, I think, the 700 centigrade, yeah, uh, and it's not conformal enough. So the shape of that distribution doesn't look right for this patient. And so when it paired those two features together and looked at the shape of that distribution and the shape of this patient, it went, no, 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 you could be a lot more conformal on this, so I'm going to reject the plan. And that corresponded with the human decision. Okay, so now I'll talk about the general framework for building for automated planning. And here, as Tom kind of mentioned, the typical pipeline, you're going from images to contours, and what we want to really do is sort of flip it around and go from images to contours directly to a dose map. And the reason for trying to do this is to move away from everything focused on DVHs. And the reason for that is that in the DVH, when you start summing out all over all of the voxels in the ROI, you lose the spatial information. You no longer know where the dose was within the region of interest. So then you end up drawing all of those little substructures, carving out smaller regions and smaller regions within a target or within a OAR that you want to avoid or hit in the plan. And that's what ends up with all of these planning structures. And so on the top, we have an example of a plan that actually meets all the evaluated DVH criteria but is not a good plan. It would be rejected here because it's not conformal enough. On the bottom is actually our automated plan that meets all of the same DVH criteria, but because we're using the spatial information in the image, we're actually trying to figure out at each voxel what the dose should be, so how the dose should appear spatially, we can get a dose distribution that not only meets the DVH criteria, but meets that intuitive sort of opinion and view that all of you get when you look at the plans and say, yes, that's a plan I like versus, no, 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 that's not a plan I like. So, okay, well, that sounds super complicated. And it's actually really not that complicated. So you remember all those crazy neural networks? This is a different representation. And, okay, there's a few more features looked at than this, of course. But this, quite literally, is how the computer decides to put dose somewhere. So it's, it's really actually very intuitive. It just looks at a voxel and says, okay, is this a low-density voxel? Yes. All right, is there a big gradient kind of telling me where I am in the image? Yes. Okay, now I know I'm inside the lung. And if I'm inside the lung for this treatment class, all of a sudden now I know that I have a very good likelihood of not having dose. The chances of having prescription in a breast plan inside the lung is low over all of the voxels. Now if it figures out that this is a lung voxel at the interface of the chest wall, then it knows all of a sudden, okay, now I have to put prescription there. But the high-level view, that's basically what it's doing. It's just breaking it down, much like we would when we look at the image, going, okay, well, that's, I recognize that object there. That's the heart. There shouldn't be dose there. And the computer does the same thing. I recognize that object there. That's the heart. I'm not going to put dose there. So visualizing this a different way, what it's basically trying to do is you have this huge database of patients on the far right, treated over many years here at the hospital, and now you're taking sort of chunks of the image of the novel patient on the left and you're pushing them down that tree structure and in doing so you can take the dose that we know we, that we've already clinically planned for the patients in the database and then you start mapping it over to the novel patient. So under this framework if your twin comes in they literally will get the exact same treatment. So the challenge in doing that um, where the second part of the skepticism kind of starts to come in is that you need contextual information. So we will say, okay, well, the computer is looking at a patch. And so on the left-hand side here, we have basically just a small patch from the image. And no one can look at this patch and say, yes, there should or should not be dose there. It's not possible. On the bigger patch in the middle, then we start to get an idea. And of course, when you look at the right-hand image, even within that area, just within the box there, it's easy for a human expert like yourselves to look at that and say, okay, I know where the dose should be in this image for a breast patient. So the key there is that the computer needs that contextual information. So it isn't enough to look just at a patch. And what I'll talk about next is how we actually build that global view of the patient to make something like this feasible. So we learn the context from experts. From all the plans that all of you guys have done and, and QA'd and reviewed and accepted, You've basically already given the computer all of that information it needs contextually to figure out which patches should and shouldn't have dose. 
So what we're able to do then is look at two examples like this. So on the top, on the left, we see an image, and on the right, you see something very confusing. What that actually represents, every solid color in that image is a region the computer has automatically segmented out as a homogeneous region it figures in terms of where it's going to put the dose. So they're not quite, they don't have to be square patches, basically. They can start to be chunks of the image. So you can think of it in the sense that we could have done this ourselves if we wanted to. It would be extremely laborious. We could have over-segmented the image to such a degree that we had this part of the breast and this part of the lung and this part of the heart. The computer has then gone and done that automatically, but it's only done that for areas where the dose on the image varied. So in breast RT, there's never any dose on the right-hand side of the image, on, or left breast RT. So the entire right-hand side of that image is considered as one giant block from its perspective. It does not care about it, just like we don't care about it when we go on planets in this case. And what's interesting is then that it can automatically learn that the patient on the bottom here is similar because it has similar target position. So it gets a similar breakdown. There's a similarity between those two images on the right. Probably not to everybody here, but definitely to a computer scientist. And if we introduce a different image on the bottom, all of a sudden the computer can figure out that this image is getting taken apart differently because the target has moved. So you'll notice that the bright yellow area, its representation of that target has shifted over in the image. And so it knows now that that means I have to treat this patient differently. So it's not looking at just that single patch. It's looking at where is the target with respect to the lung. And now that influences the decision it makes throughout the entire image. That's how it's able to actually make something like this work. So we did some preliminary studies with just basically, as Tom was saying, where we could just create the raw dose map and not go through inverse planning. So we have an estimate of what we think we could treat. And we compare that to the clinical distributions here from the hospital. And we did this for a training data database of about 1,100 plans across multiple sites. Uh, we tested on about 440 patients. This is a very large amount of data. And on average, we got about 82% gamma accuracy or agreement between the novel plan and the clinical plan, which doesn't seem that high, but you have to keep, consider that even if we plan and replan a patient between two different planners and two different groups of reviewers, those two plans will not have 100% gamma agreement. There will be small variations in where we move the dose for things that won't affect the DVH, and therefore we don't care about clinically. So we've also gone and then done full inverse planning. So now we have a deliverable plan, and we've done this in collaboration with others here, and doing now actual double-blind head-to-head, or sorry, <clears throat> not head-to-head, double-blind review uh, of plans across a number of sites. And what we see here, so prostate, for example, four out of five plans, the expert actually win, win or tie against the computer. So the computer won in three, and it tied in one. So four to five, it was as good or better than the clinical plan, despite being fully automated with only the essential contours, so the target uh, and the OERs that we evaluate, and nothing else. Uh, similarly, for lung, I think it's 80% there, uh, the same rate, oropharynx was 67, and rectum, well, we've only done one, but it's 100%, but it's only one. So there's a caveat to that statistic, I know. There's no p-values on that one, okay? All right, so what do these actually look like? Um, this is the automated versus the clinical, and I mean, there's lots of experts. Does anybody here actually know which is which just by looking at it? Probably not. Um, I don't know which is which either. Actually, the top one's the auto. But so here we can see the automated and the clinical plans, um, and on the right-hand side are the dose distributions for a uh, head and neck case. Uh, this is uh, another case where we have, again, automated on the top and clinical on the bottom. So what's interesting here is a structure on the bottom, like the bright areas that we want to be able to avoid, the computer was actually not even given that contour to generate this plan. But because it's a very bright structure, it's very easy for the computer to automatically segment out that area and go, yeah, they never put dose there. So that's something very easy. It, the second that we're extremely consistent about something in terms of never putting dose somewhere or always putting dose somewhere else, those are very easy problems for the computer to recognize. The challenge lies in where we have the trade-offs. So this is another plan. Again, uh, this is lungs. So we have the top is the automated and the bottom 
is the clinical. Uh, so we're presenting another paper. Uh, it's going to be presented by Matteo Welch at ICCR um, in a month, I think. And in this one, we wanted to actually go and then compare how this could work with the OARs versus without. So to even become more provocative, now do a planning system where we literally only provide the target and we don't even contour anything else. And I know people are going to say, well, you're crazy because you have to contour them anyway to evaluate them, and we admit that, of course. Uh, it's more of an academic exercise. But what's really interesting is, again, if you look at this example that's done without the contours, the dose automatically avoids the entire bottom pinched region there. Because, again, those are simple structures. It's, you might say, well, auto, I've tried automatic segmentation in those structures, and it fails. But because we go and add margins to the clinical structures, it's then an easier problem for the computer to figure out, I need to avoid five millimeters around the cord than to figure out the exact boundary of the cord. And that's why it can do it automatically, even without the feature. So in conclusion, we've kind of built part of the medium machine. Uh, we're using radiomics features from patient images and ROIs to be able to learn things about where a dose should go, about the quality of a plan, or to predict a new plan. Uh, we can use features from groups of ROIs, so get really high-level contextual information about proximity between targets, between target, or sorry, between OARs. And we've got intervention data coming in as well in terms of the actual dose distribution. We can quantify its shape and appearance as well as simpler metrics like the DVH and these sorts of things and then really start to score them, including as well the beam angles and the gantry and everything. Um, and the big machine will build even more context and scale. So if you remember this example from earlier, when we originally we're just looking at that one little image and we can't really do everything we want to be able to do is we still see the full image on the right now we know what we want to do but we can add even more to that we can add the genetic information we can add information from the patient's history etc to be able to build now a higher and higher level contextual representation of that patient to get a more and more personalized treatment so that's sort of where we're trying to go and in doing that, we want to be able to do future work where basically now we can move in and also incorporate outcomes. And not only so predicting outcomes like they do in radiomics work, but also optimizing those, our planned predictions for the outcomes. So now I've seen this patient 15 different times in 15 different slightly variations between all of their, I don't know if it's twins at that point, but all of their clones. And they all have a very similar treatment, or sorry, very similar cancer, but they've all had a very different outcome. And now automatically go into the database and figure out not only, okay, this is your twin, but this is your twin with the best possible outcome of treatment. And so that's what we're going to do. So thank you very much. <laughs>